Okay. Uh, we are already uh, live. <laughs> so wait for a while, please. Would we be able to see the participants out there? The... No, no, you, you can't. You can't. Sorry. No. Okay. okay. Unless you open up the YouTube uh, in your handphone, then you can see it. Ah, but then echo, you know, it will be ah, okay. echo if I'm opening it up side by side. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We only can see the powers, lah. Correct. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so we just assume there's only four of us. Ah, uh, <laughs> then it's better. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a good analogy, okay? Yeah. yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the platform for research and development, your preferred YouTube channel on research methods is dedicated to those who have little or no knowledge in research and those who want to refresh their understanding and knowledge of research as well. Students pursuing research at undergraduate and postgraduate studies would be greatly benefited. We are proud to present to you an inspirational and motivational program for researchers across the globe, especially PhD scholars. The PhD Journey. All right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah and very good evening. Uh, also, very good morning and very good afternoon for participants who are joining from different parts of the world. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to Professor IRTS Dr. R. Badlisha Ahmad, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Malaysia Police, as well as uh, Professor Dr. Pem Kumar Razagupal, the Honorable President of the Malaysia University of Science and Technology, for accepting our invitation and uh, for being here today. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Um, and also, I would like to uh, acknowledge and appreciate uh, Dr. Shamini Abdullah for accepting our invitation to become the host of this uh, mega webinar series. Uh, for participants, uh, basically, this is going to be a mega webinar series. Uh, every month, we'll run two episodes, inshallah, and Dr. Shamini is going to host uh, all the sessions uh, beside uh, the other two person. Uh, let me also uh, extend warm welcome and uh, thank to the co-organizers. Uh, we have uh, many universities uh, from few countries who have uh, uh, joined uh, us uh, to organize this event. Uh, of course, it starts from uh, my university, University of Malaysia Police, University Tun Hussein Malaysia, University Kebangsan Malaysia UKM, University Putra Malaysia UPM, University Technology Malaysia UTM, University Uttara Malaysia. International Islamic University Malaysia, Tech, University Technology Petronas UTP, University Tun Abdul Razak Uttar, Malaysia University of Science and Technology, the IEEE PES, the EPM chapter, and then we do have also uh, Daffodil International University Bangladesh, the Northern University Bangladesh, East Delta University Bangladesh, the University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh, uh, we do have the Cambridge Institute of Technology India. The Islamic University uh, Bahalpur, Pakistan. And we do have also Abu Bakr, Tafawa, Belawa University, Bauchi, Nigeria. Uh, and, and last of all, we do have a youth foundation uh, who has actually uh, supported us and helped us to organize uh, this mega event that, that we are having today. All right. Uh, the main objective of this uh, program actually to inspire and motivate the potential uh, PhD scholars or the PhD scholars who are pursuing PhD program now. Uh, we know the issue of considerable dropout rate in doctoral programs is well documented across the globe. PhD students are highly, uh, usually highly, uh, high, uh, usually high achiever, who are among the brightest and most successful students. And also they are subjected to highly selective process of admission. 
And yet, compared to all other degrees, the rate of completion of doctor doctoral studies is very alarming, which is estimated about 50%. Okay, uh, basically, this is the lowest among all degree programs uh, that every university runs. So under this backdrop, uh, the PhD journey a mega webinar series uh, is designed to basically inspire and motivate PhD scholars, potential PhD scholars, academic and researchers across the globe. And uh, I would like to thank all of you who have joined now and uh, will be joining uh, us shortly. Um, and also I would like to thank few people who work behind the scene, uh, especially uh, Ms. Sonia, a PhD scholar from UTHM, uh, Brother Rashid Karim, a PhD scholar from uh, UNIMAP, and uh, Brother Saleh Mansoor Ahmad, also a PhD scholar from UNIMAP. And also we have uh, Brother Mohammad Ibrahim, uh, a master student of UNIMAP. Um, and also we have uh, Dr. Chalida Somsa from EYTM Kedah, uh, who, who was at the, at the very beginning, we, we started thinking of designing this program. And uh, I think one more last person is Dr. Faria Rabbi, who has completed PhD from BPM, now working in Bangladesh. So these people were there behind uh, uh, us. And uh, we'd like to thank all of them for working hard to organize this event. So with this uh, uh, a few words, I would like to pass the button to Dr. Shamini. Um, she is a senior lecturer at University of Malaysia Police. And uh, she was my colleague before. We, we used to work in the same faculty before. And uh, uh, let me pass the button to her. Uh, Dr. Shamini, the session is yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introductions from Dr. Amino. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And warm greetings to all of you viewers out there tonight. As uh, Kasham, you have to unmute your microphone, Kasham. Actually, it's not mute. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, the speaker's unmute on. We cannot hear you. Unmute your microphone. I, I can hear, Dr. Shamini. I can hear too. Uh, so how do I repeat again? You, still, you have to unmute your microphone. We still, we cannot hear you. Actually, uh, it's... No, uh, no. Yeah, the mic is okay, uh, Promino. Okay. Yeah. I can hear Dr. Shamini. Fine. Okay, the host actually uh, muted my mic. We still uh, cannot hear you, Kasham. We still cannot hear you. Um, okay, let, let us see what what's, what's wrong. Okay. Uh, Promino, can, can you, you hear, hear me? Prof, can, can you hear me? Kasham, are you using something additional beside uh, the computer uh, microphone? Promino. So we cannot hear, hear you. Us. Somehow we cannot Doctor, hear you. Doctor Amin, people can hear. Doctor Sham, yes, I just confirmed. The computer, uh, Oh, okay, we can so hear. We cannot because... hear you. Somehow we cannot hear you. It's okay, okay. Amin, yes. Can hear. Yes, 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 yes. Kasham, Kasham, continue, please. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, thank you for the introductions, Prof. Doctor Amin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Warm greetings to all you viewers out there tonight. As introduced, I'm Dr. Shamini Abdullah from the Center of Liberal Sciences, Faculty of Applied and Human Sciences, University of Malaysia, Prince. Embarking on your PhD journey is often solitary. Yes, sir. Assalamualaikum. When I embarked on my PhD journey, okay. I was yes, yes. Asked what was ahead, the precision of academic writing, the solitary process, the importance of the composition team, my capabilities and the amount of the reading and rebuffing. For tonight's show, we will share you real life stories and experience to inspire you to continue pushing yourself to complete the journey that you have started. And together with me tonight, we have two eminent figures in the academia. All right, and uh, I, will, I will introduce them. Our first panel will be Prof. IRTS Dr. R. Bradlisha Ahmad who's the Vice Chancellor of University of Malaysia Police, who was a full-time PhD student in the engineering discipline. So I guess let us all watch uh, a short introduction of, of Prof. Patlisha.
right, and we will go on to our second panel for tonight, which is Professor Dr. Prem Kumar Rajakupal, from President of Malaysia University of Science and Technology, and he's actually was a part-time PhD student in the economics discipline. Please let us watch his introduction. Dr. Prem, good evening. Thank you, Prof. Bhatt and Prof. Prem for joining us tonight. And thank you, audience, for tuning in to our session tonight as well. So without wasting any time, let us start our session. I will direct my first question to Prof. Bhatt. Prof. Bhatt, are you ready? Yes. All right. Let's go to our first question. In what word, in one word, what comes to your mind when we say PhD? All right. Uh, very good uh, question there. Uh, I think this word is after uh, many years. I come out uh, when you talk about PhD, the word that uh, in my mind is uh, research. So mm -hmm. if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, the definition of research is uh, systematic investigation into uh, and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusion. So that's uh, the, the word that uh, really in my mind when you talk about PhD. Because when you talk about PhD, you have, uh, whether you like it or not, you have to uh, do uh, some sort of research. When I say research, it means that you have to implement a certain tasks uh, to solve uh, problems. Uh, the tasks uh, include, for example, the problem finding, where I think this is the first thing that you have to do. Uh, and actually asked by your supervisor uh, in the name of what's the problem statement, right? So that's the task number one that usually you have to do, uh, problem uh, finding. And also number two, uh, you have to, uh, to do data finding. You have to find facts and figures uh, regarding all the problems. And it must be sufficient enough to, to identify the problem that you want to solve. And then you have to do a data analysis because there are so many data that you will be collected during your first year of your study throughout your reading of your journals, uh, conference papers, and so on. So you have to have ability to do data analysis. And then uh, you have to design experiments. Uh, in case of you are in the field of social science, you have to design your survey. Uh, to be able to collect the data. In my case, I'm in engineering uh, background, so I have to design the experiments or the simulation, the model, in order for me to do data collection and able to uh, analyze all the data. And then uh, I think the number five is the ability to uh, present the results and conclude uh, and, and then suggest for solution. And uh, number six is uh, ability to argue and also defend your finding. Of course, uh, when you in your first year after you completed your first year, you have to uh, present your uh, proposal. So you have to able to argue and also defend uh, whatever finding that you have uh, found in your uh, work. So for me, research is the suitable words if you ask me regarding the PhD. So it's involved lots of works, 
and you have to do it uh, systematically so that you are able to complete. I'm sure all the students here who are listening to me would like to complete their PhD. So always remember that uh, when you when you are in this field, when you are doing your PhD, that means all the time you are implementing research which include a uh, uh, number of tasks which you have to implement. And uh, you have to remember that once you completed your PhD, you still have to do lots of research. And uh, you have to do this throughout your life. Because, because for me, uh, research is not only uh, stops after you completed your PhD, but it's also in your life. You have to do lots of research in your work especially uh, if you are an academician, uh, because uh, for you to be able to uh, get promoted, of course, you have to do the research, publish more papers. And if you are at uh, industries, you have to do lots of works to solve problems and make more money. So you have to more money for your uh, industries. So that's why in your life, research is all the way in your life until you die. So PhD is just the beginning. And the word that I, uh, uh, in my mind about research is uh, for PhD uh, is research. So uh, for PhD is just the beginning of uh, research work that you're going to do in your life because you will continuously uh, perform uh, more research in the future. Right. Thank you. Very interesting perspective, uh, Prof. Bai. So your perspective on PhD is actually research. You need to identify problems. You solve the problems through data collection, through experimentation, and it also requires you to actually present what you have discovered and to defend that what you have discovered is actually what it is. All right, and about making money as well. All right, yeah. interesting. All right, what about Prof Rim? What do you think, Prof? What What do you think? It's what when you think of PhD, what comes to mind? Well, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Shamni, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my experience uh, taking up this PhD journey. Um, for me, um, a PhD is about thinking process. All right. Um, it shapes an individual's um, thinking process, which should be very structured and a systematic way of looking at a problem or an opportunity. Yeah? So it is not only just an academic achievement, but for me, it's also a learning that a candidate will go through and eventually he will know how to look at problems, um, not just looking at only one option, but various options, and then coming up with a recommendation. Yeah? And um, getting back to academic, well, it is um, a contribution to the existing body of knowledge, a significant contribution as a candidate, as a PhD uh, candidate. When you complete your study, you are going to contribute something to the existing body of knowledge in your own discipline. Uh, that's about the PhD. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Prem. As you can see, audiences, there are really two um, vast uh, perspectives. We have one from the sciences, actually, you know, um, embody PhD is a very structured uh, research process. And if you look at the social science perspective, which is um, which was actually elaborated by Prof. Prem, it's actually more of a thinking process. And and it's that thinking process is actually converted into a research uh, structure. So it's very interesting. Thank you for sharing, Prof. Bhatt and Prof. Prem. I'll direct the next question to Prof. Prem, actually. Prof. I mean, uh, yeah, all of us have gone through our PhD journeys, some sweet, some maybe very challenging, some wanting to give up. So my question to you is, what motivated you to keep going during your PhD study, during your journey? I mean, I'm sure you had your trials, you had your challenges, but what made you push on? Because you were actually working full time and in a private sector on top of that and you were actually pursuing your PhD on a part-time basis. And I understand that you were also holding a, a top post at your company at that time. So please uh, share us how, what kept you 
what kept you what was the drive that actually pushed you to move on Please okay help. okay thank you dr shamni um my uh academic pursuit from my younger days wasn't an easy but it was full of challenges i think my immediate uh, family members would watch for that 1999 1991 i applied for my bachelor's degree in usm and i was rejected that itself was a big hit for me yeah and i i really wanted to go into usm but i was rejected but then i took it as a challenge i told myself yeah one day i must come back to this university to do my studies so that was my beginning and um, upon completing my bachelor's my master's in uum my bachelor's in rmit and working in intel and i saw the circle of friends my colleague in intel when i turn around i look easily more than 100 old people are master holders and they are doing very well and uh, being a manager in intel the supply chain manager and planning manager i was always challenged to come up with ideas and make presentations yeah not only to my colleagues in malaysia intel malaysia but also to uh santa clara my colleagues so when i need to do presentation and i see some of my colleagues who are already phd holders the way they articulate their thoughts the way they present things is beautiful yeah and i was very fortunate um in 2001 and 2 to work with professor howley from stanford university on a research with intel and dell working on rfid in logistics so that motivates me and professor howley is the guru for supply chain in the world and i had an engagement with him and uh, that motivated me with my phd to start up phd in supply chain and then while taking up the journey it was full of challenges especially trying to balance between work family and studies but the key for the success is actually discipline like what um uh jim colin uh said in his book discipline discipline execution will make a success so i had the discipline to devote my time every day without fail minimum 2 hours for my phd so that was made me success thank you prof prem it's uh, very inspiring actually to hear coming from somebody who's actually um I mean, you were working in a private sector, and uh, and you actually faced a lot of trials from the start. But as you said, maybe it's the driving force is also perhaps the people that you had surround you that actually yeah. fuel that drive, that that motivation to not give up to continue. So I hope that you know what we what you're sharing with us will actually inspire on our audiences tonight. That who knows, are actually going through what you went through. <laughs> All right, thank you Prof Prem and I'd like to ask uh Prof Bad. I mean everyone has this notion of, you know, you know all of us I mean talking from experience, you know, I was very excited to start my PhD. You know, I waited for 10 years actually before I could I could start it. And when I was starting it, I was so excited. It was like, wow, finally, you know, I'm going to do something. But then there's always this but You know, it doesn't always appear as how it seems to be because we are always blinded by a certain conception that it's going to be a smooth sailing journey. You know, you set targets, you set goals, and you you know you do your timeline and you say, "All right, I will get this done within a certain amount of time." I'm coming back. You know, I'm coming back with what I've 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 start what what I want. So, Prof. Bai, what are some common misconceptions uh, that? Yeah. Thank you, Rajesh Mini. Thank the you, thank you. So there are two mi- uh. <laughs> so there are two misconceptions. Okay. Two misconceptions. Number one is people thought the PhD is easy. Yeah. So they want to go there and have a holiday and register, <laughs> and then after three or four years, they will complete the PhD. Number two, people thought of PhD is very very difficult. That's why you have heard about uh, the terms uh, permanent head damage. There are many terms that I cannot remember, but I the, the one that I remember is permanent head damage. 
Once you completed your PhD, that means your brain already damaged like 90 or 80 percent like that. So for the uh, is neither of uh, whether PhD is easy or difficult because uh, some also thought that PhD is as I said easy. You go there, register. It's like a regular examinations. So when uh, people have the PhD, when they talk, they say, ah, this PhD is nothing, you know, nothing so special. So they can just talk whatever they want because they have a PhD. So they, they can talk and they hope that people will listen. So they thought it's PhD is easy. The, the second one is PhD is difficult. So they thought of, uh, they never think to do PhD because all in their mind thinking that PhD is very, very difficult. So they might die doing the PhD. But uh, let me uh, assure that all the PhD candidate here or even the supervisors here, PhD is just a normal ways of education. I think although it's the highest level of education, uh, since the A level, O level, uh, degree, masters and PhD, this is a high level of education. So it is not as easy or it is not that difficult as long as you know how. So, for example, before you embark on PhD, you, you should know what you want to do uh, in terms of your capability, what's your expertise, because you want to embark on something, you want to do research without any, any prior knowledge. Of course, you will have difficulty to, to, to do your uh, PhD. And number two, you should know your capability. What is your strength? You don't simply just uh, do PhD just because you want to do it. Because you heard somewhere that this particular uh, research area is now the buzzword or these are the research area that everybody is doing. So you have to understand your capability. If it's not within your uh, capability, not within your knowledge, so you will have difficulty to complete your PhD. Uh, number three, you have to get the right person to supervise you. It's like a marriage, you know, you have to have what you call it a chemistry between the supervisor and supervisee because this is the only person really will help you uh, to complete your PhD. And, and then uh, number four, of course, you want to do it not because uh, someone forced you to do, right? You want to do it because you want to learn new things. You want to gain more knowledge. So when people think of PhD is very difficult journey, yes, of course, it's difficult, but it's not that difficult as long as you know how to do it. A similar like you are in your daily life, you're driving a car and also riding a bicycle. So sometimes people fail to get a driving license, maybe two or three times, but that doesn't stop them uh, to get the driving license. So similar with PhD, it's not that difficult as long as you know how to do it. So at the end, once you have the PhD, I think you are able to solve lots of problems because you have been trained to do this thing. So don't, don't afraid to do PhD because as I said, this is the highest level of education. Once you completed your PhD, you should be a better person, especially in terms of problem solving because PhD is something new, you embark on something new that you, you don't have lots of knowledge before. So you embark on that, you're able to complete. So you have successfully complete a systematic ways of a, a problem solving. And uh, don't expect PhD, once you complete it, you will, be, uh, you will become uh, Stephen Hawking or you will become uh, uh, Einstein immediately, immediately after PhD. No. So it takes time for you to become a good researcher once you completed uh, your PhD. So for me, for people uh, think about PhD is so difficult. No, it is not that difficult as long as you know how uh, to complete your PhD. So you have to listen. For example, now you are listening to this uh, webinar. It's good. So you know what you should do and you should know uh, what you're supposed to do. Like I'll give you the, the, the things that you have to do and uh, you have to know before you embark on your PhD. So it's not difficult. It's just a normal education where you have to know how and how to complete it. But the, for the easy, as I said before, people thought it's easy. They were they just going for PhD because, uh, for example, like uh, lecturers in university, when it's time comes, it's their turn to do their PhD. They thought, yeah, now I'm, you know, 
release from my responsibility as the uh, academic uh, staff though you are going for phd actually you're going for holiday so that is also wrong as i said phd is uh, neither easy nor wrong uh, easy or uh, difficult as long as you know how you should be able to uh, complete your phd so don't worry this is just a normal life of course you have difficulties but uh, in order to uh, i advise you do phd do the right way inshallah you will become a better person in terms of solving many problems in your in your life and also in your career as an academician thank you prof very uh, motivational very um, educating actually so i guess what i can sum up is basically we shouldn't be too idealistic when we start i think we should be prepared that we also may face some difficulties only thing i do have a it's like uh, Prof. Bhatt did mention that, you know, in your third point that it was also important to actually select the right supervisor. But how would we know? I mean, talking from experience, um, when we, uh, you know, when we choose the university and we choose the, we do choose our supervisors, but it's like an onion, you know, when you, when you see first impression, we think, all right, maybe this person would be a suitable supervisor for me. And then, and then as you get to know, it's like onions, you know, as, as layer by layer. And then mm. you discover, I think not everyone is lucky to actually discover or, or find out that, you know, they have chemistry with their supervisor. And mm. sometimes, or most often, uh, I think in most cases where, you know, some students face is like, you know, they tend to have a fallout with the supervisor. I would like to ask Prof. Prem, what do you, what do you think about this uh, this notion, I mean, of course, all of us want to have this, uh, you know, a good relationship with our supervisor, but that's not always the case. What, what are your views on this, Prof. Uh, well, um, I think I was fortunate to have good supervisor. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> by luck, I'm not too sure. Uh, but uh, I think um, every supervisor, um, when they take the supervis supervision task for a student, I'm sure they want to make it a success. Yeah? yeah. No one wants to take up a student and uh, waste their time as well as the student's time. So what's important is actually trying to understand the, the uh, supervisor. Yeah. Um, there will be some supervisor who are very highly structured. Each time you meet, they say, "Hey, bring me a Gantt chart. I want to see a Gantt chart. I want to see the timeline. I want to see your deliverables." Yeah. Whereas some supervisor are very easy. They say, "Okay, how much you have progressed?" You finished chapter one. Okay, can I see your problem statement? Yeah. So you need to understand your supervisor. Yeah. And getting back to uh, Prof. Bart's um, uh, question that he posed to him about PhD, the notions and all. For me, it, it's it's a real journey, you know. And also, um, people out there they say that uh, PhD is something your self discipline and your self monitoring. Uh, you don't. You, you wouldn't know your progress. No. I think that's wrong. You know your progress. The moment you finish chapter one, you know you're 20% almost done. Then you move on to chapter two. Then you move on to chapter three. Then you go for your proposal defense, right? So you yeah. are able to monitor your progress. So there are some people out there, they say, oh, PhD, you know, uh, very difficult to monitor progress. It's, you know, um, you can drop any time. You know? So I, I don't think so. You know, we should look at things like, well, I can monitor my progress by the chapters being assigned to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, my supervisor is there to support me. But don't go to supervisor for every answer. That's not the right way. Indeed, your supervisor need not necessarily be the expert in that area. Like for my case, when I chose supply chain, my, there wasn't any supervisor in Malaysia for supply chain in 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, 2002. There's, there wasn't any professor in supply chain. And... I got Professor Mohamed Sulaiman and Prof. Swizer. Both of them, Prof. Swizer was operations and uh, Prof. Sulaiman was leadership and strategy. It's totally, yeah, two fields totally. that are different, yeah. totally different. Yeah, different. But they took the challenge to support me, yeah. Um, well, it was my, a lot of exploration. And um, I, I also like to make a point here that do not highly depend only on your supervisor. As a PhD candidate, this is the best time for a student to write into other professors from other universities. 
yeah make connection with the other professor when you say you are a student they will support you i had a very good working relationship with the professor joseph from arizona state university and prof howley from stanford university to support my indeed my framework my theoretical framework they supported me i had a very close working relationship with them so phd is interesting actually yeah well <laughs> that's my thought yeah dr sharmini right thank you prof you actually shared a very interesting insight i mean this is something i think most uh, of our viewers today would would, would you know would, would would be very appreciative i mean when i was a phd student i think most of us i mean we tend to constrain our 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 communication with our supervisor and of course within the research group in that department I think what you have done, you actually step out of the box. I mean, it. it I, I didn't think of it either. You know, sometimes it's true what we say. Our supervisors don't really know everything. You know, they are expert in certain aspects, and the rest of the time, you have to actually discover it. And you know, through a lot of hard work and communication with your colleagues, but it, the thought never occurred to me to actually seek out, uh, you know, help from other professionals. It was like a unsaid rule that, I mean, this is the notion that I think most of us have. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. That you know, you're you're only supposed to seek advice from your supervisor, follow your supervisor. So we don't tend to want to ask from other experts. But I guess what you have done is you assured us that I think we can, we can do that. That means we can. We are having certain problems. You don't really need to constrain towards just uh, limit ourselves to the university itself or or or, or the the supervisor and, and just the research department that we are in but we can actually seek out from other universities from other professionals to actually guide us in our throughout our journey so it's a very um a very useful insight prof so i mean on that note i would like to ask i mean we're talking about preparation um you know setting off in a on a you know when we start our phd it's very important that we actually don't be too idealistic we, I mean, we have to be prepared to to tell ourselves that you know our journey may not be smooth. We'll be facing trials, and to not to have uh, too much of confidence in ourselves either. To be prepared that there might be things not going the way we want. We might face challenges with our supervisors. But there's another thing that's also important. You know, okay, the selection of supervisor is number one. But the next one is what actually? How does one plan the kind of um, what kind of research that you need to do so my question to you prof Prem, what was your phd title and what made you decide to choose that title to work on the research area of the study i mean to know that this is what i want to do prof? okay okay dr shalmini yeah um i looked at it this way when i was working in intel uh, i saw the challenges in intel in 2001 two, i saw the challenges and um, Intel headquarters, Santa Clara, there was a lot of discussion happening in Santa Clara, talking about supply chain is the next wave for the business. And to be competitive advantage, um, companies has to go into supply chain, uh, has to design, remodel their supply chain, uh, the upstream and downstream. So I, I really don't know much about this. And uh, I went uh, reading some articles and there isn't any book in Malaysia at the time our supply chain yeah so when i read this article called uh, the triple a supply chain which was actually written by uh, prof howley and posted by harvard university talking about agility adaptability and alignment mm -hmm. so that is one for the first step that that kicked off my title the second one was actually the challenges that i saw in intel yeah and the third thing is i always wanted to do something different i i just want to work on something where, where that particular area is already been fully explored and I can't contribute anything. Yeah. So I took the challenge of exploring a study that is not been conducted in Malaysia and uh, where I find that there are already experts talking about it and uh, exploration done in the US, but in the Malaysian perspective, nothing much has been done. So that's where I chose the topic and I worked on supply chain partnering in electrical electronic industry simulation yeah right so actually i think one has to also look at the current trends in order to know what is suitable and to see whether you can actually seek the appropriate expertise as well am i right yes thank you prof Prim. 
I will now direct my attention to Prof Bai. Prof? Yes. All right. Can you share your PhD experience? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I completed my PhD uh, for three years and 11 months. Completed. Uh, but my submission is uh, after three years and nine months. Wow. So I'm a bit, yeah, a bit lucky because, as I said, uh, like Prof. Pam, they know what to do during his work, working at Intel and so on. My right. experience is through my master's, uh, uh -huh. Master of Science, where mm -hmm. I managed to do my project at the end, master's project. And I continue my uh, project for the PhD works. Even okay. though, even though uh, I continue my work, but uh, the, the PhD title uh, is only finalized after one year and a half. So after reading and reading, because during the master's, the scope of your research is very, very, uh, very, very limited. And uh, again, I, the reason why I chose my supervisor at that time, because I know mm -hmm. Is very responsive, uh, very helpful, and he mm. has the knowledge of that particular uh, research area. So mm. I, uh, my experience uh, in, in, as I said earlier, uh, mm. one year and a half to finalize the PhD title. Was it and after that, the Yeah. Sorry, after was the, it after yeah. proposal defense? Yeah, I mean, yeah. During, yeah. during that time, there's no proposal defense. They just oh, let they you go. Uh, it's up to the supervisor if they, if they think that you have enough uh, data, uh, enough uh, novelty of your work, then you mm -hmm. are ready for submission. There's no oh, such okay. thing as a proposal defense at that time in UK. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I also very lucky because I, I talk to other people because, as I said, one of the important criteria for to complete a PD is you have to have the right tools. For example, in my case, engineering, you have to have tools uh, to run your experiment. Uh, so without the experiment, of course, you will not uh, uh, obtain any data because data is very important. Once you have the data, then you are able to analyze your data and then come up with the conclusion. My supervisor, every time when I, I saw him, he will ask, but Lisha, where's the data? He keep asking the data. I said, wait, Prof, <laughs> the data is coming. I'm just doing the experiment at this particular moment. So finding the right tools is very tough. Uh, I'm so lucky because I got my colleague also doing the very similar uh, uh, research. So I managed mm -hmm. to, to use the tools for my experiment. And then during my time, I married. Uh, although I'm very young, but I married during my young time. Uh, I have... Uh, three kids, uh, so very tough to manage uh, the time between your family and your mm -hmm. study, so very, very tough. And I also work as a part-time uh, cleaner uh, to support uh, financially uh, my studies. And, uh, you know, during the, during the studies, sometimes you cannot sleep. Uh, sometimes you woke up uh, at two or three o'clock in the morning, and then I uh, rush to the university to find out what are the, the faults of my experiment. So ideas keep coming in during your, your PhD work. So there's no, there's no like uh, during office hour that you think after that you relax. No, sometimes ideas during your studies comes anytime during your, your, during your sleeping also. So at that time, you have to do it. You have to go to the university, to your lab and implement or, or diagnosing what's the problem uh, out throughout your experiment. So it's very, very tough. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so lucky. And uh, as uh, to be honest, uh, you know, PhD is about sweat and tears. If, uh, if I tell you I cry, I don't know whether you uh, believe it or not. As a man, sometimes men don't cry. But for me, I cry a lot <laughs> for the PhD. Because the reason why, because I need to complete the PhD because I'm under scholarship. So if I could not complete the PhD, I have to pay the whole uh, lot of uh, scholarship uh, money. It's nearly half a million of ringgit Malaysia, nearly like 300 to 400,000. So, you know, the pressure that I have with the families and the scholarship they have to complete, so very, very uh, tough. So, uh, in fact, so once you have uh, uh, the, the tools, the knowledge, a good supervisor, then you are able to collect the data, you are able to make some analysis. 
And then the difficult part also. I thought getting the title is also difficult, one year and a half. But no, uh, apart from the experiment and get, uh, collecting the data, the writing is also a difficult, uh, difficult part because, uh, you know, people like me in the Malaysia and sometimes uh, uh, English is not our, our first language. So sometimes we, we can talk, we can do, we can understand by reading, but writing is also difficult. But I was again very lucky uh, because I have a very good supervisor. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he responded very well on in all the writing that I submitted to him. He he checked my writing like uh, like I send it uh, like in the morning, in the afternoon he will give it back to me uh, with all the correction and also he checked the grammar and all the the sentences everything. So I was was very lucky during that time. So I didn't need to send my thesis to the proofread. And need to pay because all the things uh, checked by by uh, supervisor. And the most difficult parts during my studies, I have to send my my wife and my children back to Malaysia because I have a difficulty to support uh, my uh, family at that time. So I have to stay alone, work as a part time uh, cleaner, and also I work at the industry. I don't know whether you have eat this chocolate McVitie's <laughs> biscuits. So I work there. So you see, it's not an easy task to complete your PhD. You have to work hard. You have to have a discipline, and you have to have you have to manage your time. But I am not saying that I just uh, spend my time with the family and also the PhD study. But I also mix with some friends, playing sports, at least to release your tension during your study. So, in conclusion, it's not very easy task. But for me, I have a, a, a spirit. Uh, when I do things, I like to complete it. They call it. I call it a do or die. Just do it. You know, you have to complete it. So uh, it's very tough, as I said. But sometimes when you do it right, uh, inshallah, you will able to uh, complete your PhD. Thank you, Prof. Bhai. It's uh, quite um, actually quite sad in a way. I mean, you did have a lot of struggles, and but look at you today. I mean, you. You overcome it, and I'm quite uh, what quite uh, touched actually by your by your experience. And I think what you shared today, I think many many of the our viewers are actually going through it. I'm sure. And like you said, uh, it was not only us females that always shed tears. I think I remember countless times where I'll see my supervisor, and he would actually have a box of tissue ready and like <laughs> alright. And then you go shedding tears. So it happens to also to our male counterparts as well. And of course we cry, but we cry less than the we cry less than the women. <laughs> Are you sure, bro? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I think your story inspires, I think, so many of us. And I think all our audience out there tonight, I'm sure. And I would like to, you know, ask Prop Prem now. Thank you, Prop Pat. Prof Prem, I mean, uh, listening to the experience shared by Prof Bhatt, I mean, as we embark on our journey as a student, you know, sometimes we got to change roles because most of us who start our PhD, most of the time we would have actually was a student before and then you, you are employed, so you're more into a working mode. And then you got to actually transpire into a student mode again and at a different age. You know, I recall when I started my PhD, uh, I started quite late, not to say very early. I was already 35 at that time. And, you know, in my department, everybody was actually in their 20s. You know, it, it takes quite a lot of adjustment, the maturity, you know, the, you know, the, the adjustment to actually mold yourself back into a student life. And then being a matured student and you're having families, like what uh, Prabhat actually shared, you know, you got to work part-time because you need to support your family. And in Prabhat's case, it was actually quite, you know, it was, you know, it must have been quite bad that he had to actually send his family back. So I would like to ask you, because this is us doing it on full-time and we were having difficulties actually adjusting into the routine of a student. How did you, I mean, you were actually on part-time. So how do you actually, you know, um, sort of um, sort of uh, mold yourself in into the routine? So can you share us, um, you know, I'm sure most part-timers out there listening would like to hear how actually did you adapt, 
you know, you okay. were actually having a job that you need to keep. I mean, most of us full-time students, we do a part-time job to have the income. So the pressure of, of performing is not there. We, you know, we do part-time jobs, waitressing, cleaning, but you were actually holding a job that demanded you to fulfill certain KPIs. You have a salary that you need to take care. You have staff that you need to take care. But at the same time, you also had your PhD. So can you share us your routine or, you know, being a part-time student? Please, Prof. Okay, Dr. Shalbudi. Uh, well, um, I heard from Bart um, his uh, story. Um, yeah. Similarly, I had my part of my story. Um, well, I was uh, working in Intel, um, and uh, my hometown is about 60 kilometers from Intel. Daily, I have to be at Intel at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., I devote myself to Intel. And during that time, sincerely, I don't have time to read through read any of my PhD work. No way. Fully Intel job. Yeah. Now, I was quite fortunate that USM is just beside Intel. It's just about two to three kilometers. So every day after 6 p.m., I will be at USM library. That is 6.30 to 10 p.m. every day I'll be there. The working days, the five working days. I'll spend about two hours to two and a half hours every day at USM. Yeah very painful very very painful because after 10 30 i need to drive back crossing the bridge 60 kilometers again back to my own town yeah and that was my routine for four years was yeah. it on a daily um daily basis prof it, it was on daily basis for working days that is five days in a week yeah of course sometimes four days in a week but that was my routine taxing i mean very very taxing uh, but but then I enjoyed my journey because every day when I spend my time in the library reading, I acquire something new. And I have the habit of writing, taking notes. I have the habit of taking notes. So each time I read something, I take note, I start to write, scribble, yeah? And I keep it and then the next day I go back again on it. So it was a very interesting journey because every day I'm, I'm looking at things very new. And, um, I don't mind sharing with you, telling you all that when I started my PhD in USM and I asked my supervisor, Prof. Schweizer and Prof. Uh, Suleiman, I asked them, can I enroll for a research methodology class? You know what was the answer? What? I'm sorry, there's no research methodology class here for PhD. We only have for MBA. Oh my God. So <laughs> then, then I turned back to my supervisor, how am I to go through my research? Exactly. So Prof. Suleiman, yeah. Prof. Suleiman told me, Hey, okay, I'll tell you. Go read Uma Sekren's book, Zygmunt's book, Cooper's book, yeah, um, Yin's book. It's all in the library. Read, and every month you give me a summary of each chapter. Yeah, so apart from doing my PhD work, I have to review, read this book, and provide a review to my supervisor. And that really gave me a very good insight about what is research methodology. And that has drive me to even co-author two books on research methodology today. I've authored two books. And last month, I got my book translated in Myanmar language, if any of the participants here from Myanmar, yeah. So, so it, was, it was really good, you know. It was really good that, um, that I was not enrolled into any class, but then I have to review the books and that review of the books gave me further insight about the uh, methodology of taking up a research, PhD research work. That was my, my, my routine and my journey here. So basically, you actually read, reading. So I guess our advice to all you viewers out there is read, read, read. I think you should sleep, eat, drink, <laughs> reading. <laughs> Enjoy reading. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> As a, as a tedious task, but rather learn to embrace it and enjoy what you're reading. Yes, yes, it's yes. Tough, I think, but I'm sure, but it's something that we have to do, right? Yeah, no choice, yeah, no choice. <laughs> you, you, you know, Dr. Shamini, um, <laughs> in, in, you know, after going through the PhD as the reading process, you know, mm -hmm. um, in 2011, I attended um, uh, the, the master class of balance scorecard in Harvard University, yeah? I, I was enrolled into a master class for balance scorecard and personally trained by Kaplan and Norton. You know, 
finishing their master class in Harvard University on the way back, 18 hours flight. Yeah, I bought their book, Premium Execution. And I, because of the PhD learning process, I managed to finish about 100 old pages. In the that flight. flight. Yeah, yeah. The 18 hours. Can you imagine? So yeah, where I, I got it? Where, I got, where I got it? I got it from the PhD journey. So you students out there, read. That is the, the key word, reading. Yeah, right, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess, yeah, you should read. And it's a very interesting insight, Prof. Yeah. That. Thank you. And now I will direct my attention to Prof. Bhatt. Prof. Prof. Bhatt? Yeah, I'm still here. All right. Okay, yes, we know that uh, we, have, we have listened to your journey in the beginning and then we listened to Prof um, Prim's uh, routine on how he was as a student on a part-time. I mean, going back to your experience, uh, even though you did have a very good supervisor that assisted you, but I guess on your personal side, being a student, you did struggle a lot. Just would like to ask, I mean, I, if I were to put myself in your shoes, I don't think it was something easy for you because being in Malaysia and you were actually overseas in a very different uh, country with different culture, different language. I think you were in Scotland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Right? Uh, and you had to work and having to send your family back. Was there any point uh, throughout your PhD journey that you felt like giving up? Yes, of I mean, course, of course. And, when and I send, you didn't, right? But you didn't in the end. I'm sure you had no. the notion, but you didn't. Yeah. So maybe you would like to share with us, um, how did you overcome? How, how did you overcome that struggles? You know, what kept you, kept you going apart from having to pay up the scholarship money? I'm sure there were <laughs> others, other, other motivations that was your driving force. Please, Robert. Okay, okay. Right, the toughest time is, of course, uh, as I said earlier, uh, mm -hmm. making decision to send my family back to Malaysia. That's the toughest one, because uh, as a, as a family, I think nobody wants to be separated from their family. So you want your family to be there uh, at the difficult time or easy time. So you have, you want to have your family there, but at that time, I think I have to make that decision. Uh, whether I have to uh, worry about being my family uh, there or I would be worried about the financial issue. Uh, and because of I'm in UK, which is not in my hometown, so I decided to send my family because it's quite difficult uh, or to get help from others uh, to support me financially. So that was the difficult part uh, in, in my PhD journey. Apart from that, I think the, the second one, second toughest uh, uh, part is getting the data. Because as I said, my supervisor always asking me for data. Where's the data? Where's the data? So in order to get the data, you have to have the tools, you have to have the software or experimental setup uh, to have the data. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, I think after one year, I managed to get all the required data and uh, I able to uh, do the analysis and complete uh, my PhD. Of course, during this uh, toughest time, mm -hmm. what really motivates me, as I said, uh, yeah, uh, I think as a Muslim, I think I have in my mind that uh, this is the opportunity given to me by the uh, by the by Malaysian government uh, to get knowledge. So I decided as a Muslim, I think uh, I should. Uh, I, I do this because of the of the knowledge. I want to increase my knowledge and I hope I can be become a better person. And uh, once completed my PhD, I will be able to serve uh, the community. So uh, this really uh, motivates me because I always believe people with a good knowledge, uh, they could be able to, uh, to contribute back to the society based on knowledge that they have. So, uh, as I said, uh, this really motivates me. Whatever you do, just think about uh, the knowledge that you'll get. You know, sometimes people also fail in their, in their degree. But uh, sometimes you need to think positive. Although you fail, you still have the knowledge with you. Nobody can take it away. Uh, so, I put in my mind, also in my heart, 
whatever PhD work that I've, I've, I've done, actually, it's all mine. It's not supervisor. Supervisor guide you only. But uh, you are the only one uh, manage to master, or not master, or PhD your knowledge. It's yours. It's, nobody can take that away. So that really motivates me. Whatever knowledge that I've gained from this PhD journey, it is mine. I can share uh, through other people. And you know, also, uh, at the end, uh, I want to become a good person with the knowledge that I have, with the experiences that I have uh, uh, gone through. I just want to help people. And uh, that really uh, motivates me uh, to complete my PhD. Right. So what I can sum is basically... Prof, uh, you, um, I guess the driving force was basically that you knew that the attainment of the knowledge would actually benefit many. So I guess that kept you going, uh, moving, I mean, pushing yourself ahead. So you decided that, I mean, you, you, you put that as a top priority and everything else became second. So that was how you actually shaped your mind and, you know, to think of, yeah, at the end of the day, rather than just helping your family, but what if you finish your PhD, you will actually benefit even more. So okay. that was the drawing for us. Okay, that's a very good, um, it's a very good sharing of, uh, I don't know, it, it's uh, it's something which I actually, I never thought of it as well for my PhD. I mean, it's normally most of us, I can not speak on most of us, I'll speak on my mm -hmm. was But she just want to finish it, you know, but you don't go beyond thinking that the PhD is actually yours. And the knowledge that you actually seek out and you have can be actually be beneficial to so many, many, and maybe it goes on even when we are no longer in this world. So I guess that's a very, very good, um, very good, good, I don't know, notion. Maybe that I guess all us students, all you students out there can actually, you know, maybe change your mindset and, you know, force yourselves thinking that you're here on a journey. You're here with an objective. You're here with a, with a direction that what you seek and what you find out will actually benefit the world. So I guess that is what should keep you going. Thanks, Prabhupada. Prabhupada, how about you? You know, I mean, you were sharing with us quite a lot throughout your journey. I mean, your PhD with your traveling, your reading and having no classes to assist you in your research methodology. And that actually inspired you to actually produce two books on your own. But I'm sure, I mean, throughout that journeys that you were having, did, didn't it cross your mind that uh, I think I'm going to give up? You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm going to finish because I think throughout my journey, there were times I felt that I was not going to finish. I actually told myself that, am I ever going to finish this? You know, and there were times I felt like just throwing the whole laptop away and like, you know, I don't want to see this anymore. Mm -hmm. So did you have any of those, you know, as you were going through your journey, Ralph? Um, okay, Dr. Shamini. Uh, sincerely, I never had the thought in my mind that I'm I want to give up. Never, never. Wow. Because I, I, I always, as I said, I enjoyed my journey in PhD. But then I went through struggles. That is true. I went through struggles, tough time, difficult periods, and twice I was on the sick bed. Okay. Twice, I, yeah, I was on the sick bed twice, not because I'm tired of doing my PhD, but because of my sinus problem. Twice, I was admitted to hospital. Yeah, and uh, my immediate uh, family members they came about and told me, "Why don't you give up your PhD? You know, uh, you're falling sick. Just forget it. Yeah, uh, nobody is asking you to do your PhD. You got a, you got a good job at Intel. But what else you want? You know." Uh, but then I I told myself. Never settle, keep going. Never settle, keep going. This is what Steve Jobs also said, right? So, yeah. <laughs> never settle. I always hold to this. Never settle, keep going. And my own uh, thought that always I put in my mind is success for me is mm -hmm. making something impossible possible. When something people say it's impossible, you make it possible then that is what I call a success. So with that in my mind, I kept on going and uh, I always believe in having the momentum. That's okay. important. It's not like, you know, uh, up and down like wave. You have okay. to have the momentum going. 
momentum should go. Yeah. So I had the momentum going, and I I don't mind sharing some difficult uh, struggles that I had. Yeah. Um, one I can always recall is my experience with my supervisor, uh, my second supervisor, Professor Muhammad Sulaiman. That was one year upon doing my PhD, where I thought I'm ready for my proposal defense. I wrote about almost about 110 pages. You know, I thought the quantity really matters. So I gave <laughs> it to my professor, Professor Sulaiman. And right. Sulaiman, Sulaiman told me, okay, Prem, you come back. You come back next week, you see me. So when I went back next week, he he, he held the book, the the the, the thing that I wrote, the hundred old pages in his hand, and he just left it on the table, and he said, you can have it. You please go now. That's it. He pointed at the door and he said, you go. I was like stunned. I don't know what, what happened. Yeah, I mean. Um... I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. And, and, and I don't I don't know what to say, you know. And and I was that time, like what Prabhupada said, uh, at the age of 30 plus, you know. And me, at the age of 41, I shed my tears. <laughs> because I don't know what to say. <laughs> Did he say anything apart from you know giving it back to you and like asking you to leave the room? Yeah, his body language was that, you know. His body language was that, and oh, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I I shed tears and I don't want to have any further discussion. I know he's already upset, so I took right. my work, I went back, and then I wrote an email. Uh, first sentence is that I asked for apology that I did not meet his expectations, yeah? Then I asked for an appointment. He gave me an appointment. I went back. He called me. He asked me to take a seat. And he explained to me. He spent almost two hours with me. Explaining page by page. Page by page, he explained to me the weaknesses on my work. Yeah? And then, finally, he told me, remember this prayer? Mm -hmm. A PhD work must be thorough. Okay. Second, a PhD work must be exhaustive. exhaustive. You must be exhausted. Okay. And third, he said, a PhD work must be exploratative. Okay. Which until today, I remember. That's what he told me in year 2003. And until today, I remember, and I pass on this message to my students. <laughs> so that is my experience, a tough time that I had uh, during my PhD. So we need to be, if you're not exhausted, we haven't done enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we, we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves. To be honest, ask ourselves. We don't need yeah. to ask our supervisor. Ask ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Have I really, you know, gone all out? You know, have I been so? Are you drained? You know, totally doing what you need to do. Exhausting, yeah. explorative. We need to explore. It's a very, very. Uh, it's, it's something not easy to swallow. You know, you got to be really exhausted. But I guess it's what it is. I mean, that is how. I mean, it's your experience, and I think from Prabhat's experience, it's the same. I'm sure both of you were totally. You know. Pull out, drain, you know, you put in your best yes. in order to get things done. So I guess a note to all our viewers, we, you know, we need to give all out. I mean, giving 50%, it's not enough. You know, you got to give 100%. And I guess, and also, I think what I learned from your experience is like, you were very gentlemanly in actually managing the first situation when he, you know, when supervisor just gave you, gave you back your, you know, your proposal defense and tell you to leave the room. How many of us today will actually just take it and leave? I think they would have some verbal clashes and you actually apologized. You know, you 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 humbled yourself. I mean, despite you know, despite look look apart your positions that you were holding. So I think being humble, you know, you approached him back and, and look at the result of it. He actually sat with you going through page by page. Who would thought he would actually do that? I mean, to me, it's like a supervisor did that to me. I would think twice, like, how do I go back to him? But I guess the first start was saying sorry. And I think by saying sorry, it, it, it you know, it gives a whole new, 
you know, it makes people react differently. And I think these are the things that we don't have with our students these days. So I think my advice to all of you is like, sometimes our supervisor may seem to be harsh, but actually it's for our own good. And I, I think most students, I will tell my experience with my students, they tend to always argue back. It's like, why do I need to do this? No, 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 I think you are wrong, you know, and I'm right. So I hope that by what you have shared, you know, will tell students that, you know, we supervisors out there is not always wanting to make life difficult, but it's actually trying to tell you that you need to do something. I mean, you need, I mean, like what you did, Prav, I don't think many would have just gone back and said, sorry, you know, it's like, no, I prepared yeah. over the years and you're chasing me out without even saying a word. I think I would have changed supervisors if I were you at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then you and, and, giving and you know, Dr. Shamini and Dr. Shamini today, me and Prof. Lehman, we are like friends. Yeah. And I'm each sure. time I see him, each time he is, I think maybe Prof. Lehman is about 75 now. And each time I, I see him, I hug him. It, it's it's like a fatherly hug, you know. It's like a fatherly hug. Yeah. yeah. And, and 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 I see him. I, I really feel like, you know, the man who really the enlightened one, the me. One, the one is there. The one is very strong, you know. It's very strong. The man who enlightened me, yeah. yeah. And similarly goes to Prof. Swizer, my supervisor. She's in now University of Malaya. Mm -hmm. These are the people who enlightened me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess all of us out there don't give up, you know. Maybe the first encounter with your supervisor may be harsh or what, but I guess maybe that's the start of a very beautiful relationship. Like, you see what's happening. I think sometimes it's through difficult times that we actually discover each other and, and that's where the bond actually fosters and not giving up and like, okay, fine, I'm going to change my supervisor. I think most of us shouldn't give up so easily. I think that is what we should tell all our PhD students, you know. it's Thank you for the insight, Prof, and for sharing with us, you know, what you went yeah. through. Robert. Still here. All right. Um, okay, the both of you actually shared, uh, I think as what we can see and the audiences have listened, I think the journey that you went through is not easy, difficult, lots of tears, but that didn't make you all give up. And I guess what, what, what we should tell students is, I think it's all right to be experiencing things that are not uh, positive. I guess it's part and parcel of anyone's PhD journey. Okay, going back now to more academic uh, structure of a question. Uh, we talked about uh, how you start. Uh, we talked about uh, the selection of um, supervisors, having the right tools. We talked about, uh, you know, building yourself up with uh, positive uh, qualities, positive attitudes, positive mindset. Now I would like to ask, I mean, this is what, I think most students go through, whether it's uh, at the proposal defense um, stage or whether even it's at the beginning of the stage, you know, when you when you approach a supervisor, sometimes you are told to change so many things. And sometimes it's even during the pre viva you know, you have a smooth proposal defense and then suddenly at the pre viva you're told to actually change uh, certain parts of the chapters and, you know, or maybe do a, a, a recollection of data. Did you have to go through any of this, uh, Prof. Matt? And if you did, uh, how how did you actually confront that situation? What did you do? And how did you feel at that time? Yeah, as I said, uh, during my time, there's no such thing as proposal defense. It's only you uh, presented, present it to your supervisor. So he will advise you whether your uh, proposal is good enough for a PhD or not. But uh, during my time, I think my supervisor has uh, helped me a lot in terms of the writing. As I said, I'm not good at, at writing last time. So every time when I write something, he will check very thoroughly and very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, the first uh, writing, he will have many red marks in throughout all the pages. I think mm -hmm. mostly all the pages. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, he, he do the correction. And then um, I'm quite happy with the correction that he made. Because mm -hmm. uh, when I read it again, I think his suggestion is all very nice. Uh, it's all very good. Uh, uh, is a very good correction. Uh, so uh, as I remembered, uh, in writing-wise, I'm okay. 
uh, apart from having difficulty to write it uh, well, but my sponsor helped me. But mm -hmm. I still remember that all this correction is not uh, made only once, but actually more than three times. So after one correction and then one correction and then one correction, but I, as I remember, at least three times. It could be like five or six, maybe seven times. And I still remember that he told me, uh, but Alicia, your chapter one, I, I sent the chapter one. He said, no need chapter one. Send me chapter one, the last. So because chapter one is just to summarize everything that you have done. Yeah. So yeah. that should be the last uh, write up that you should do for your thesis. So mm -hmm. uh, I think I have a very good spoiler in terms of checking my writing, uh, guide me on how to... Uh, uh, to write properly in terms of the content and also the languages used. Uh, so I think I don't have really a uh, difficult difficulty in writing. But as I said, the difficult part is getting the right data uh, because without a data, then you couldn't have, you could, could not write the thesis. You couldn't have uh, analysis. So at that time, I have lots of data. So only the problem that I have is uh, finding the suitable data to be included in the thesis because so many data that I've collected throughout my experiment or simulation. So as I said, uh, yeah, writing is difficult, but my supervisor make it easy for me. So thank you. <laughs> so you had a very, you were lucky in a sense that you had a very good supervisor that assisted you in your writing process. As we, frame Kumar, uh, as we prop frame, I think uh, you you started off maybe like having to redo your proposal defense, but actually that didn't give you up. You didn't give up, so you actually you know sat back with your supervisor and he assisted you step by step of the way. So what I can say to all you students out there is you know don't give up. I mean everybody's journey is different, and some of us you have. I think every supervisor is good. It's just how you tackle them, and I think the most important is humbling yourself before them, being apologetic first, and always, you know, approach them. I mean, this regardless of how they actually treated you. I mean, look at Prop Rame, you know, they started off on the wrong foot, but in the end, they're best friends today. As they provide, you were lucky, and I think there are some of us who were lucky as you, and I'm sure you're still keeping in touch with your supervisor because he, he has assisted you so much. So, you know, it goes a long way, I mean, Having a supervisor is the start of a relationship, actually, and something that will last until until the end of our lives. So thank you for, for sharing the both of you, Prof. All right. I, will, I mean, we were talking a lot about, you know, the negative aspects of the PhD journey. I'm sure they were also sweet memories. And this I'd like to direct to Prof. Rim. What about the sweet side of the PhD journey, Prof. Rim? What did you love most? What did you enjoy most? during your PhD journey? Uh, well, upon completing my PhD, I learned how to look at issues and opportunities in a structured manner, which until today, mm -hmm. I apply the, the flow of the PhD mm -hmm. at my office that is running today as the president of the university. Mm -hmm. I need to have strategy. I need to do the exploration and I need to bring the university and ensure the university is sustainable, financially sustainable and so on. Yeah. So I apply the tools that I've learned from PhD, mm -hmm. the techniques, the approach, yeah. Exactly. Identifying the problem, then putting up the purpose, yeah, the main objective, then you have specific objectives, mm -hmm. then the questions that you need to ask. Mm -hmm. And then doing some background, best practice, benchmarks outside and bring the benchmark best practice to the floor mm -hmm. and then exploring what is the best with the limited resources that you have, working on it and then making uh, monitoring, having the tools to monitor. So it's all again, what I'm doing today back at the university is actually I, what I learned from PhD. It, so the PhD is not just about, you know, uh, getting the title of PhD. It's also the process. Yeah. How the process the process it, yeah. yeah. And, and, and when the way you articulate thoughts in PhD, it's all about evidence, evidence, evidence. You cannot yeah. speak anything on your own. You cannot take out things from your mind out there and put it out there. You can have 20 years of experience, but that doesn't matter. 
What's yeah. important is evidence. Right. You need to have evidence, yeah? So you need Some to bring problem. evidence, yeah. So this is where I, when I do benchmarks, when I do best practices, I look for it, and I'm bringing in evidence to, to the table, yeah? yeah, for the business. So I think this is the best part of the PhD. So PhD, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a destination to say, I'm finished with my PhD. No, it is a journey. Even after your PhD, you continue, you continue to ex explore further, excel in whatever job that you have taken up. Yeah, that is um, PhD for me. Yeah. So it's what you learned throughout the journey, throughout your whole duration as a student, is that you implement it back into your life and make it your life principles. Yes. Right? So, yeah. Thank you, Prof. And um, Prof, but so what about you? I mean, yeah, what are your sweet memories uh, during your PhD journey? I don't think I have a sweet during the <laughs> PhD journey. <laughs> The only thing I'm very, very happy uh, to get uh, another, uh, to get the, where my children are born during that time. And also uh, the, the most, uh, the best thing in my life during the PhD journey is to listen uh, to the examiner saying that uh, this word, congratulations, yeah, congratulations, you have passed your viva and then... Uh, <laughs> That's where that's where you really feel very high at that time. Seems like all your hard work has been uh, paid off through mm -hmm. this uh, uh, to this viva. I had my viva for three three hours, so mm -hmm. uh, it's very tough one. The all the examiner go page by page. I have to answer all the questions. Some I I can answer, but some also a few things I couldn't answer. But the supervisor are not allowed to answer any of the question. But at the end, they, they agree uh, to pass me. And uh, it's very nervous because, uh, you know, you don't know what do you ex what do I'm going to expect during the VIVA. I read a lot of books. I prepare a lot during the, before the VIVA. I read books. I read again the thesis many, many times until uh, you feel so tired of reading it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, luckily... As I said, uh, very, very fortunate for the three years. I never thought of, of course, I'm planning to complete the PhD, but sometimes you have in your mind that whether you are able to complete your PhD or not, looks like your work is, you know, for me, la, sometimes you, you, you thought your work is very low level, nothing new, but mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. once you're able to, to prove that your work uh, has the novelty, uh, mean different from others, then you are able to to pass your your viva. So for me, that's the highlight uh, because I could could not wait any longer. I'm too much. Uh, remember my family in Malaysia. I'm rushing to go back. I complete my correction for only two weeks. Then I told my supervisor, look, I've already, you know, how confident I, I was at that time. I bought my ticket before the Viva. I thought, uh, yeah, uh, because uh, I, I spent only a few weeks of correction. So Alhamdulillah managed to do that, book my ticket and everything. So two weeks, I complete my correction and send. And then I feel happy so that I can go back and meet my wife and my children, of course, my parents as well. Right. Okay. So yours actually hearing the examiner say you have com you have passed your viva, and with prop frame is actually um, whatever he learned uh, during his journey is what he he used it to apply in his life. So right. two different perspective, but yes, I think I'm happy with both. I think yeah, who isn't happy to hear the examiner say that you know you have finished? I think that is what most of us want to hear you know, during our viva. So thank you, Prof. Prof Prem. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay, actually, I want to ask the both of you. I'm not going to like go. This is a question, I think. Uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not a difficult question. Would, would both of you, I mean, given a chance again, lah, would you like say somebody tells you would you do your PhD again? What would you answer? 
I'm absolutely open. yes. <laughs> All right, from friend, yes, uh, from friend. Another another exploration. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You know why? You know why? Now I know what are the weaknesses I had in my PhD earlier. Even though I passed my PhD in the Viva, now I'm going to highlight all my weaknesses. Okay. So you the chance, yes. <laughs> so you will do it again, all right. It's a uh, right? interesting <laughs> um, Robert, so how would you answer this? I mean, if somebody says, uh, would you like to do your PhD again? How are you going to answer? <laughs> After you completed the Viva, you said, this is the last time you will uh, ever experience this. <laughs> Just completed your Viva. But after a few months, after you've been in your career, like one or two years, then you, you thought, oh, this, you should have done it better. Because yeah. I think PhD, uh, because PhD, as I said, is a, is a journey where you are, is the highest level of education, where at that time you are struggling just to complete it. But actually, when you look back, I think uh, there are many things that you can improve, many mm -hmm. things that you still can do a, a lot of improvement. So yes, if you ask me to do a PhD again, yes, I would do that again because, because I know the tricks and how to get the PhD <laughs> and, uh, and the tools that I know. So no problem for me to, to do another PhD. But of course, uh, mm -hmm. the, the reason is not to do that because there are so many things uh, in your career that you couldn't do that. But I think throughout my experience, I think I have I've done a lot of uh, PhD in some sort of, uh, you know, throughout my research work mm -hmm. uh, and uh, writing the research proposal, publish papers, uh, reading all these PhD theses by the students. I think I've done a lot more than just one PhD. Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's true. In a way, in a way, it's true. You're doing a, another PhD, multiple PhDs, actually, when you're actually confronting your students, correct? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. But thank you, Prof. Prem. I think let's give a break to both the professors, okay? And I think let's focus our attention to our viewers now. I think we have quite a number of questions that was raised throughout the, the session that we had early on. So maybe I will direct these questions to the both of you and... Um, how do we do it? Uh, maybe I will direct the questions and I will leave it open to either of you. If you feel like answering, you'll just, you know, just answer. Okay. So I'll go on to the first question from our audience. Okay. What are the most important topics in education to choose for PhD? This is from Ali, Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali Azidian. Okay. Oh, <laughs> in education, <laughs> I think yeah, proper. Could yeah, sure. That one. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, looking at the trend today, it's all about digitalization. Yeah, and the industry 4.0 is still heading all the industry, uh, including the service sector that's education. Yeah, so uh, you can explore um, how the industry 4.0 drives education of the future. Yeah. So what are the tools that can, you know, of course, there are nine pillars in, a, in Industry 4.0. You need not focus all the nine. What can really support education? And you also need to confine yourself. When you say education, are you looking at higher education or uh, secondary education or primary education or childhood education? You, you need to have the right scope, yeah? And then you look at the Industry 4.0. That, that's, that's my input, yeah? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prem. Uh, Mr. Ali, I hope that answered your question. Okay, maybe we'll go on to the next one by uh, Mr. Sarawanan Sundara. Okay, he's asking, Hi, Prof. Can sharing with us your experience during proposal defense? And okay, I'll rephrase that. I think he's basically asking, Can either of you share your experience during the proposal defense and why what? So maybe. Robert, yeah, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, as I said, during my time, I don't have a very systematic proposal defense. Yeah. The only thing is that I need to write a proposal uh, mm -hmm. and then present it to my supervisor. So basically, what you need is you have to make it clear that whatever you do, there are novelty in your work. So in terms, in terms of novelty, I mean, you can't just say this is new thing that you've done. You have to compare with others. You have to have enough. 
uh, or sufficient uh, reading materials and also other methods that people have proposed. So uh, it's, it's, it's very thorough. You have to read a lot and you have to write a lot. You have to do a lot of analysis. And then I think in the proposal is you have to convince to whoever that uh, uh, hearing to your pr presentation that your method is uh, novel and nobody has done it before. And very clear that what you want to achieve uh, must be beneficial to whatever research that you are going to do. So making, because in the Viva, I think mostly in Malaysia, they ask for, uh, in fact, other overseas also, what's the novelty of your work? So you have to make it very clear on your work, uh, whether there's a novelty or not. And the output must be also very clear and very objective. Okay, thank you, Prabhat, for that insight. Can we answer one more question or two more questions? Please, one you more? can go in two. No problem. Two, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll ask this one by from a Miss Gloria. Okay, she's asking, Prof, how do we know if we are ready to pursue a PhD? And how would the jack of all trades know which PhD to go for? Now, this is interesting. A jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take this question into two, uh, two parts. Huh? The okay. first part is how do you know that you're ready to take a PhD? Is that the one question? Yes, she's asking okay. that. How do we know if you are ready to pursue a PhD? Yes, exactly. How, how do we know okay. we are ready? Okay, there, there, are, there are many ways. People, mm -hmm. Some people, they want to take PhD because they want to change their career or they want to enhance their, acad their academic career. Yeah? Okay. So, by default, if you are an academician, then by default, in order to move up, develop further in your career, you have to take a PhD. Uh, that on, you got no choice, yeah? But those who are working, nobody force you, nobody push you. So this is where the trigger point will come to you while you're in the industry. While you're in the, in the, in the industry, you see that, you know, there's something that, you know, uh, something new has emerged. And uh, you, you find that hey, it needs an exploration. And then you need to ask the question, are you willing to spend time? Are you willing to spend time? Yeah. So if you are willing to spend time, devote yourself, you have the means. I think that that is the trigger point for you to start your PhD. The key is, are you willing to spend time? And are you willing to sacrifice, sacrifice the next four to five years? Devote yourself? Then, yes, you go for it. That's it. Yeah, that's the first part, yeah? The second yeah. part, uh, Dr. Shamini, can you just repeat again? Yeah. She, she's asking, how would a jack of all trades ah. know which PhD to go for? <laughs> so this is, where, <laughs> this is where, this is where when you finish your undergraduate, you finish your master's, while you come to your master's, you already know out of the 12 subjects in your master's or 10 subjects in your master, which one you have keen interest you're really interested in out of the subjects, which subject is really, you know, deep inside you and take that up. Yeah. yeah. Take that up as a topic for your PhD. Maybe Prabhat, you can share your thoughts on this too. Yeah, Prabhat? Yeah, sure, sure. All right. The question to whether you're ready for PhD, you're never ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is from a science perspective. Uh, sometimes you never ready. You thought you are ready, but you are not ready. So depending on why why you want to do PhD, you ask yourself why you want to do PhD. If you want to do it for your future career, it's also good. If you want to do it for you want to increase your knowledge, it's also good. But mm -hmm. whether to be ready or not, I think most people are not ready. But you have to have the patience and the good reason why you want to do PhD. Then you follow all the requirement. Then you will be ready. Somebody need to tell you that you have the enough, uh, the sufficient knowledge to do uh, or not. So the jack of all trades. I mean, don't ever try to do whatever you you like to do. You you know, you it's not your knowledge, it's not your background. So be specific on what you do. As I said, PhD is a high level of uh, knowledge. So you cannot just, for example, if you are uh, social science, you want to do engineering. Of course, they're not allowed, right? But some people <laughs> tend to do that. No yeah. way. Don't yeah. don't do that. Don't do. Don't, don't ever do that. Don't even try. <laughs> don't even try. Okay. Uh, PhD is a journey. 
Uh, if you think you want to do PhD, do PhD, make sure you are able to complete it. After the PhD, ah, then difference is that you are ready now to explore anything that you like because you have gone through that uh, the okay. systematic uh, the, uh, research education. So you are after you complete your PhD, just do whatever you want. But for the sake of PhD, make sure you want to. The reason is to complete the PhD. Just don't just don't go there and bash to anything oh, that no, you want to do. You, you heard something very interesting. Uh, IR 4.0 where you have not, no knowledge. Uh, be careful with that. So make sure uh, you have the knowledge and of course the other tools also you have to have some knowledge of it so that you are able to complete. So let me make you again understand uh, PhD is research but in order to do PhD you must think to complete it not just to do the research to complete the PhD after that okay you can do whatever research that you want. So what I can sum up is, is two distinctive uh, notions being shared here, but I guess it is linked. I think from Prof. Bhatt's point of view, it's more on a mental perspective. I mean, he talks about you having the knowledge is important and, and none of us are actually ready because it's true. We don't really know how much we actually know until we actually embark on something. And on the other hand, I think what Prof Prem has actually given input, it also matters. So I think what I feel that a combination of what you two have shared will tell you whether you're ready or not. I mean, of course, in pursuit of a knowledge, uh, you also need to have the means as Prof Prem has shared. I mean, are you willing to devote your time? Are you willing to, you know, to sacrifice things, time, money, um, you know, yourself, you know, in order to pursue something. And also having the means is also important. I mean, some of us want to pursue a PhD, but you don't have that financial capacity. I think most of us, I would say I was fortunate because I was a scholarship. And I did realize during my journey, I was also doing, I did my PhD in UK. And, and I think in my department, I was the only one on scholarship. And I, I had colleagues in my research team that actually had to drop their PhD halfway because... They couldn't, they didn't have the financial support. Mm -hmm. And you know, that made me realize that I was very lucky because I didn't have that to think about because my tuition fees were paid. And if I wanted to work part-time was basically because I just wanted a few little luxuries in my life to make my, you know, to smoothen the, the PhD journey. So what I can sum up is you need both. I mean, yes, we, we cannot really, we, we are ready in terms of physical means, yes, as what Prof. Prima shared. But whether or not you're actually ready, we can't say, we, uh, not to say can't say, you need, we cannot put a definition on knowledge. So I guess in order to know whether you're ready or not, you actually have to start on it. Then you actually know that I'm ready. You know, in a way, I think that's what I'm summing up from what I gather from the two of you. So I hope we answered your question, Gloria. Do we want to go for one more question before we continue with questions that we have for the both of you? Okay. Sure, sure, please. Yeah. Oh, one more. Um, okay, let's see. This one talks about um, balancing. Uh, okay, no, uh, balancing work, PhD, and family. I think it was answered uh, during the our question and answer initially. So I will skip that and I will go on to this. Um, Okay, this question is from Mr. Muhammad Raihan. He's asking, is a PhD really worth pursuing? How many PhD students really get productive or real-time using output from their PhD research? I think this is quite an interesting question. Actually, I mean, most there are many out there who have completed PhD, but actually how many of us are actually... I mean, actually contributing, you know, you're not keeping your PhD in a cold storage and doing something else. Now, how many of us out there actually are doing what you started off during your PhD and, you know, expanding on it? So I think this is what is asking. Is it really worth pursuing? And how many PhD students really get productive or real-time using output from their PhD research? I'm addressing this to the both of you profs. Yeah, okay. Um, well, um, if you are an academician, 
definitely uh, upon completing your PhD, mm -hmm. uh, they used to say, you publish or you perish, okay. <laughs> right? So then you have to continue, <laughs> right? I'm sure Dr. Shamini, you're doing that too, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, so you have to continue publishing. No? So it's worth, yeah? So you have a continuity after that, yeah? If you're an academician. Well, then on the other aspect, if you're an industry player, you're yeah. an industry yeah. practitioner, yeah? A PhD will support you to bring uh, whatever thoughts that you have in a very structured manner. If you're working, you'll be able to put your thoughts across to your superiors, your supervisors in a more presentable manner that people will accept it. Or if you're finishing a PhD and you want to become a consultant, oh, excellent. You will do a perfect job to, to share with the, the team here. After finishing my PhD, I took up quite a number of consultancy job in uh, Sudan, in Thailand, in Dubai and all. It, it, it was all through the PhD work that I got. Yeah, it helped me to put across my thoughts and each time be presenting a PhD holder, you will always have evidence who said this, who said this, because we are trained that way. Yeah, right. so, so th that's what I, I look at things, yeah. The continuity of PhD, yeah, it's really worth, yeah. It really means a lot, makes a difference, yeah. Prof, what do you think? All right, for me, I think um, uh, mostly people think about the output of PhD is publication. Mm -hmm. uh, they can produce like a 10, maybe 20 papers out of one PhD thesis, but depending on the paper. So uh, throughout my experience that, of course, the journey of doing PhD is something very uh, valuable. That mm -hmm. what I learned, the output of my PhD is usually in terms of the knowledge, number one. So as an academician, I think you will use that knowledge uh, in your teaching uh, and also in your whatever work that you're going to do, like your consultation and so on. And uh, you have to remember, sometimes the PhD level, uh, mm -hmm. whatever you're proposing, uh, the technique that you're proposing, uh, it, it is not... It's not available. It, is, it cannot be done at that particular moment because the technology is not there. So all, all about the theoretical achievement. Sometimes you do experiment, okay, but uh, sometimes the, the experimental uh, setup is just not, uh, the, the product itself is not uh, economically to be uh, mass uh, produced. So you have to understand, PhD is a higher level. doesn't mean that once you completed your product, your, your research work, your product mm -hmm. is already uh, commercial, uh, commercialized, commercializable. So it's not that. It's about the knowledge. So what I learned from my PhD is, what's the fundamental of this? The knowledge, the very important of knowledge is the fundamental because from the fundamental or the mm -hmm. principle, you are able to derive more knowledge. So from there, for yourself, the knowledge to yourself, apart from the publication, and uh, I think the best thing what could happen to your PhD work is somebody uh, refer to your work and uh, throughout your ideas, people can come up more ideas to improve whatever you have done. Because research doesn't stop there. You have to continuously, continuously make more research because three, four years is insufficient to, to complete uh, a product. So you have to derive. So apart from publication, I think, you yourself have the knowledge and it helps people to improve more on the areas that you are uh, doing the research. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Bhatt. So actually, basically, um, I think uh, it's very important that, um, I mean, um, what I mean is that it's, uh, I mean, for all you audience out there to actually take note of what has been shared by Prof. Bhatt and Prof. Prem, it's, uh, we, we need to actually, um, uh, we need to actually, um, uh, how do you say, uh, we need to, we need to actually prepare ourselves, uh, basically what I can say, and, and, and it depends on everybody's circumstances. It's like, you know, each of us have a different, uh, come from different backgrounds, different you know, different ambitions, different, um, different objectives. I, I think that determines whether you're ready or not, whether, um, whether, it's, uh, whether it's worthwhile or not. 
So I guess I hope uh, what has been shared uh, would have answered the questions that you have asked. And then I think now maybe we'll go back to two or three more questions that I will direct to both Prabhupada and Prof. Krim before we end our session. So, so now I will ask, um, okay, um, Prabhupada, okay. Um, yeah. We have looked at uh, journey as an individual, as a student, okay, as, um, as a PhD student. So let's go on now to relationship between supervisor and supervisee. Of course, initially you all have shared, uh, it is important in the selection of a good supervisor and how uh, fostering a, a positive relationship with the supervisor is actually uh, important in determining how successful you are in the completion of your PhD. So what are your thoughts on a supervisor and a supervisee relationship? I mean, is it a 50-50 kind of uh, input or should it be 90-10%? Uh, what, what are your inputs? Um, please, Prof, uh, share. Maybe you, mean, you mean the relationship? Relationship yes. between... All right. the, uh, yes. Yes, yes, very Prof. important. First of all, uh, everybody has to agree without your supervisor, you cannot get your PhD. That's for sure. Even, even my supervisor joked to me, but Alicia, you argue a lot. You sure you want to get your PhD? <laughs> so, uh, you know, the relationship between the supervisor and, and the supervisor is very, very important. You must go along. As I said, like Prof. Prem, he had a difficulty for the first time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I yes. think most of us is like that. You have difficulty because you don't understand the way the supervisor works. So as a supervisor, I think you have to understand. And the most important thing, you, you can accept the way he supervise you. Uh, you have to understand. So both should understand each other. It's like uh, marriage, you know, you have to understand. Although you are not, uh, your thought maybe is not similar, the way you work is not similar, but you understand each other. So that's very important. Uh, because you have your own uh, mind, you have your own thinking, your supervisor have your, mm -hmm. his own thinking. Through mm -hmm. that, really match so that we can produce a very good product and we can produce a very good idea. So from mm -hmm. my point of view, uh, you have to respect with your supervisor and mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't worry about arguing. I think I saw some students, they are too afraid to argue with the supervisor. I encourage you, just argue with the supervisor. Even don't, as long as you don't get into a fight, you know. Uh, argue because, because you cannot just accept what your supervisor said. Uh, I always believe uh, a good a decision comes from a good argument. So sometimes not everything your supervisor knows everything. You mm -hmm. also don't know everything, but you argue. Argue in, in the sense that you want to get the best solution. So respect, don't afraid to argue, but of course argue with uh, harmony, don't fight. And uh, always have a trust to your supervisor. Because as I said, he's the one who's going to make sure you can complete your PhD. He's the one who's going to advise. He's the one who's going to tell you whether your PhD is ready for submission or not. So please have a good relationship with the supervisor. And you know uh, both, uh, 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 both strength between you and your supervisor. So you have to understand so that you can work together and at the end able to complete your PhD. Okay. Prof Prem, uh, I mean, all right. So we need to have a positive relationship, like basically, with our supervisor. I think according to Prof Bhatt, it's basically that you don't have to be a... Uh, to be submissive, that means just listen to whatever the supervisor says. There, there is allocation where you can also, I would put inverted as in argue back to your supervisor. But I think for constructive, uh, constructive arguments, that's how I'll rephrase it. Prof Prem, what do you think? I mean, I mean, yes, we have listened to Prof Bhatt's uh, view on the supervisor supervisee relationship. What, 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 what is your view? I mean. I, I, what I'm trying to say is that um, how much of input should a supervisor put into the supervisee's um, research? I mean, nowadays it's like, uh, how often do I need to meet my supervisors? You know, you have questions like this, some of them wanting to meet you every week, some once a month, some once in six months. You know, I'm sure these are the things that some of the PhD students have in their mind. What, what, what makes... You know, how often should we meet? And, and during that meetings, how long should it be? 
and, and how many uh, how much of work should the supervisor assist in the students work and this is my question to you prof frame okay uh, okay i i i think in my opinion uh, the most important one is be honest to your supervisor and build okay. the trust mm -hmm. honest being honest and build the trust is important yeah um the moment you lose your trust to your supervisor i think that's where the disharmony is going to start okay yeah? so i think that's important the second is you also need to get to know your supervisor before you begin your phd journey some university you can choose your supervisor some university you are not allowed to choose your supervisor yeah, that's so true. even if you are not allowed to choose your supervisor it is good to know your supervisor before you could actually approach or discuss with him or her the reason is because when you know your supervisor well the discipline that your supervisor came from which area the supervisor came from uh, that will help you because the way your supervisor is going to take you through the process is he is going to use his experience his expertise and that's how he is going to take you through and if your supervisor is publish papers and so on read the papers read the supervisor's papers or books that will also help you to understand your supervisor well yeah now the next thing as a student you need to know is remember that you are not the only one your supervisor is attending to so if you want to put demands on your supervisor you need to be fair to the supervisor yeah so don't don't put very heavy demand on your supervisor saying that oh my supervisor is not helping me if you're lucky like prof but got a very beautiful supervisor who's willing to go to the extent to even help on the grammar right so yes. that is your lucky yeah so but but then you you cannot be putting those kind of demands because your supervisor is not only attending to you you also got other students to supervise yeah supervise. so yeah so and uh, the key to building the good relationship is being honest and uh, build the trust the frequency of meeting a supervisor it depends on your supervisor's availability and also depends on your status whether you're a full time or a part time if you are a part time meeting your supervisor once a month face to face is good enough okay. the rest you can take it off offline using emails but if you are a full time student in the campus why not every week you try to meet up with the supervisor okay yep. thank you for thank you for this uh, insight yeah thank you prof bad as well maybe we will address you one final question and then before we answer two more questions from the audience and then we'll end the session is that all right to the both of you Sure. Yep. Okay. Sure. All right. Uh, so now we can understand the relationship between supervisor and supervisee. Okay, and I think y'all have shared so much today. So I'm having one question, last one to the board of you actually. How? What are your principles? I mean, what is the takeaway message that you're going to give out to all of our audiences tonight? Is there any principle that you would hold on in your life that have helped you to be who you are today? I mean, all of you, I'm sure, started with humble beginnings. I mean, if you look at your career paths, the both of you, you know, you did not become uh, a VC overnight. You know, it's like you started off uh, small, you know, and you struggled. I'm sure every, not only during your PhD, I'm sure at the start of just right leaving school you know you're going through your degree diploma certification your master's phd and also it's not easy to become a president or a vc of any organization you know it takes a certain character it takes a certain quality it takes a certain sacrifice to reach where you have reached so i think this is quite important to share with our audiences you know that you have shown to all of us today that you know, despite you having big names out there, you are somebody there today. But you're also humble and you actually experience what most of us are experiencing. So what is what principle you would share with all our, our audiences tonight? To, to be where you are today. I mean, to be successful, as successful as you are, as the both of you are today. So um, either provide or program either of you. I mean, we want to hear from the both of you. Okay, okay, the first one, okay. Yeah. I think I'm going to start first. Uh, the word that I always uh, use 
uh, mm-hmm. be honest be honest okay. so i think throughout my work uh, you have to be honest to yourself uh, mm-hmm. because for example in your work you might you might uh, be asked to do some some things right sometimes something uh, beyond your capability so if you work uh, with with highest level of honesty you will mm-hmm. do the work the best you can although it is not within your knowledge because you have completed a phd journey for 3 mm-hmm. to 4 years you mm-hmm. has been trained to uh, embark to uh, to get a new knowledge to come up with a uh, to come up with a new methodology uh, collecting the data do analysis come up a solution so mm-hmm. when you when when you go go out there working you have to be honest and should be able to do things that has been asked by your employer because that's very important thing because for me a uh, phd uh, already train you to become mm-hmm. a successful problem solver so in this life in all your life actually what you are doing is try to solve problems for example okay. if you are a lecturer Mm-hmm. you are given a subject or courses to teach mm-hmm. sometimes it's not within your expertise so you have to learn you have to read you have to make sure uh, you can deliver the courses that you are going to teach a student will understand so being honest do your work and also uh, in your work sometimes you are not you are not a trained uh, manager you know mm-hmm. sometimes you have been given a task to manage things to mm-hmm. manage people Mm-hmm. this is beyond your knowledge you you doing your phd basically you doing by yourself you alone you and your supervisor a few colleagues but mm-hmm. when you uh, embark in your career you you mm-hmm. will do a lot of things which is beyond your knowledge sometimes beyond your capability but you have to be honest you have to do your work with full of integrity mm-hmm. and make sure you are able to make the you are able to deliver the task being given to you so that's throughout my work that's i always think about that being honest and try to do the best i can uh, to deliver all the task given to me uh, in all on my uh, experience so i think that's the reason right why they sometimes you know you you got the you got the feeling sometimes you've been asked to lead something uh, prof or you have to lead this one you know at that time you doing the right thing because people are referring to you people can rely on you people trust you so from that uh, uh, path i think uh, you will you will be given a bigger task you will be appointed uh, you know to to lead a project so you have to do things with honesty full integrity and to do the best uh, you can to complete uh, your task thank you prof for sharing your insight and prof prem what is your what would you like to share with the audience i would compliment from what prof bat just mentioned yeah those two words are important honesty and integrity is important to complement that um discipline execution in anything that you do you have to discipline yourself yeah and i learned this detail about this discipline execution from the book good to great by jim collins very well written and this discipline execution um another version from john maxwell's book yeah uh, leadership level 5 Okay, so beautiful, good. perfect, perfect. You know, it's all about discipline. Whatever you do, you have to set your discipline. And please stop, stop giving excuse for what, why you are not able to deliver. Yeah, we have to stop that. Stop giving excuse why I am not able to deliver. Indeed, you should be doing it. What, what, so, so don't don't use this excuse anymore. Enough. No more excuses. Just keep going. Yeah, a reward is definitely assured if you have the discipline, you have the honesty, integrity. A reward is definitely assured. You just have to go with that momentum. That that's my take. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Paul. So it's honesty, integrity, discipline, and and yeah. And, Stop giving excuses. <laughs> yeah, 
can, but you can do. But you can't deliver something. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> it's true. It's uh, I think when you start on the right foot, and when you're honest, I think things pan out well. It's when you start doing things, you know, not sincerely, then that's where all the problem starts. Actually, yeah. I hope all of you students out there will actually take these four qualities. You know, honesty, integrity, being disciplined, and yes, yeah, stop giving reasons or excuses why you're unable to do something <laughs> that is just yeah that's just an excuse to yeah stop doing it yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's um and we're all adults today especially when we're already in our phd mode so thank you so much for sharing these four qualities uh profile and properly so i guess um we will end the session but before we end let's answer last two questions from two of our viewers we have one from a Mr. Harris Hussein. He asked this, why local students need to achieve GOT while other countries like UK don't have the GOT rules? Which one is better? To have a GOT, maybe it's graduate on time or not? So I'm opening up to the board of you. So either of you mm -hmm. like to answer. Back. I think you will answer this <laughs> well. <laughs> they, will, they, will, they will not like my answer. <laughs> I I uh, disagree with this uh, the term they call GOT graduate on time because you are seeking knowledge, so you cannot just force people to complete uh, with a very uh, you know short time period because GOT is mean you completed the time within that period. But uh, it uh, knowledge is you know evolve. You learn you evolve your knowledge. So mm -hmm. for me, GOT is 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 really put a much pressure to the students. But I can understand the reason why in Malaysia, uh, GOT is, uh, is one of the KPI because uh, most students are you know, having a scholarship by their sponsorship. So they are expected to complete their studies within the stipulated time. So that's the reason why the GOT is very important. And uh, I also know that the statistics uh, uh, a student who uh, unable to complete their PhD is also very high. Uh, I think uh, mostly from the, because most university they, they send their staff to do the PhD and master's, right? I think yep. the percentage is very high for them uh, unable to complete uh, the PhD. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why a GOT uh, was introduced to make sure the students are able to complete their study within a stipulated time. And I'm sure uh, the KPI is given uh, by the Malaysian government, especially the uh, Malaysian higher education, where mm -hmm. usually university will uh, reward uh, whenever you are able to complete uh, your GOT. But again, as I said, I uh, disagree with this uh, KPI. Uh, if you are given like three or four years to complete your PhD, just take your time, complete the time, because knowledge is 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 not for rushing you don't rush to get the knowledge but uh, as i said as a as a sponsorship of course they want you to complete it within the time because they want you to get back to your work and contribute but if you uh, uh if you uh, study by your mm -hmm. own means by financially by your own take your time and of course you will enjoy your phd studies and of course people want to complete earlier so that they can continue their career and later on they can get promoted and so on. So for me, GOT as a KPI is really put too much pressure to all the PhD uh, candidates. I guess those with scholarship, they don't have a choice, right, Prof, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah, you're they have to. The, your, your sponsor. So I guess those who are actually not uh, under any uh, financial sponsorship, so then, so I guess there's... Um, there's not a, a certain time limit that you need to finish your, of course. your PhD. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Prabhim, uh, it, can I ask you, and uh, uh, do you want to contribute any more, or maybe add on to what Prabhat? I I, I I I agree fully with uh, Prabhat on that. Yeah, <laughs> that GOT should not be a KPI, and you know, we are we are, we are talking about knowledge here. You know? We are talking yeah. about knowledge. Yeah. PhD is about knowledge. Yeah. yeah, it's about knowledge. Yeah, so GOT, uh, I don't, for me, I think it doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. 
Agreed, agreed. <laughs> All right, we'll go on to one last question and then we'll end the session, okay? This one is from, um, okay, there's no, uh, it's not named who actually asked this question. So this is quite uh, relevant to all of us, actually. And I think we as supervisors so have experience where we had students or candidates actually undergoing this, uh, this challenge. The question is, when the researcher has some personal health challenges and the supervisor is forcing them to complete the PhD in spite of his or her health and threats, then what? <laughs> this is how it was communicated. I mean, this is how the question is. You know, it's like when the researcher has some personal health challenges and supervisor forced to complete PhD in spite of his or her health and threatens to maybe to to maybe uh, spoil, that means maybe threaten to maybe terminate the PhD, then what happens? So how would you actually address this? I, 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 I think, I think it's unfair. It's <laughs> unfair. Yeah, I think it's unfair when someone is going through a health issue and uh, you put the strain on the person to complete. I think it's unfair. And maybe I think this is also an isolated case, like, you know, uh, isolated yeah. case. Uh, yeah. My yeah. Yeah. My, my answer to that question is uh, the student, please change the supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's very easy. As I said, the relationship between supervisor and supervisee should be very harmony. Both should understand each other. You can't force people to do things that they are, you know, they are not capable of, especially on the health problem. I'm sure people having a health problem, they have difficulty to complete the, the studies. But why you should force people to do that when you know they have a health problem? Yeah. So uh, during my time as a dean, I told all my postgraduate students, if we have a problem with the supervisor, let, let me know. And my advice to them is to change the supervisors because the PhD is your future, not the future of your supervisor. You should be able to make your own decision because, as I said, your supervisor is very important to make sure that you are able to complete your PhD. If you know the supervisor is incapable of helping you, change it. Change it immediately. Talk to your dean. Okay. Only to the dean. <laughs> yes, whoever okay. you can talk, the dean, the vice chancellor, <laughs> just use whatever means you have. You have the right. All right, yes. It's your Thank future. You. Yeah, true, actually. Yeah, it's true. Thank you, Prof. So, uh, so okay, uh, I guess we should um, end the session and I will just uh, summarize what we have discussed uh, throughout this two hour session. So before that, I'll say thank you very much to Prof. Bhatt and thank you to Prof. Frame for actually having us, for, for, for joining our program tonight, for your time and for all your insights, your analogies and your ideas and your experiences. So and to the audience, uh, thank you so much for actually staying on with us uh, uh, for this whole two hours. Uh, it's, I'm very grateful and I'm very thankful that you have decided to stay on and not drop off halfway. So what I can say is that um, I will just summarize very shortly, okay? Uh, I guess as a PhD student, you got to be ready in a certain sense. And there's always, uh, there's not a, a limit to, to when you should actually finish it, okay? Um, of course, depending on the situation, if you're a sponsorship student, then you have a deadline. If you're not, then, then you know you should do it because there's no time limit to what kind of knowledge that you can attain because you can't put a full stop to attainment of knowledge basically and then what i can gather from uh, what has been shared by our two professors here is you know we need to be honest in what we do we always need to have integrity i think having a very um, disciplined uh, quality is very important that will determine the completion of your phd and you shouldn't make excuses for yourself when you when you see yourself not fulfilling fulfilling a target set by the supervisor. And then it's very important that we actually hold a good relationship with our supervisors. And um, in relation to the last question, I think if the supervisor is giving you too much of a problem, then as what advised by our professors, change the supervisor. I think as a student, you have every right. Because like what Prabhupada said, 
it is your research. It's not the supervisor's research. And I would like to have give two takeaways to all of you. I think what we can learn from today's um, webinar is never give up. All right. And when there's a will, there's always a way. And I think both of the professors actually showed this. You know, they, they had their tough times, but because they had a very strong will to finish it, and they found ways to actually overcome every difficulty at every step of the way. So I guess with that, I'll end our session. So thank you so much for having us, uh, Prof. Bhatt, Prof. Rehm, and thank you so much to the audience as well. So don't forget, um, there will be, we'll be having uh, another webinar in two weeks' time. All right, so I hope you will join us. We will share the information soon, I guess, in our teasers, all right, in upcoming. And, um, and then I would like to also ask the participants to subscribe, like, and share our YouTube channel, the Platform for Research and Development, and hope to see you again in two weeks' time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. But thank you, Prof. Rim. Thank you. 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 Thank you.